thanks for the introduction, and uh, I look forward to fulfilling your expectations there. So, you've decided to bring a project to Apache, and that means passing through the incubator, which serves as the gateway for all of the projects which join the foundation's efforts. Incubating a project means passing through five phases before graduating. And this presentation takes its structure from those phases. So let's examine each of those uh, phases briefly and get an overview of both the process of incubation and the next half an hour or so. The first phase begins before you actually enter incubation, and that's crafting a proposal to enter the incubator. Once you're in, then there's things such as setting up uh, uh, infrastructure like repositories, website, mailing lists, and so on. Then we need to confirm that all incoming intellectual property is, uh, passes muster. That uh, the first part of that is uh, source code, but it also involves trademarks and some other things. And then uh, the next stage is to get the first Apache sanction release out the door. And once you've achieved that, the final stage is to demonstrate that the community can expand to include new people. And this talk is going to emphasize techniques and strategies for that phase, even as we go through the other phases, because most projects tend to find that phase the most challenging aspect of incubation. So when you say getting the most out of the incubator, that means more effectively learning Apache institutions, procedures, policies, and values. It also means marketing your project uh, to downstream, uh, to potential users, but most especially to uh, users who may become contributors because the contributors, uh, refreshing your contribution, that is how the project thrives. Uh, one thing we won't really be talking about is uh, how to improve software, at least directly. Uh, we won't be talking about that today, and you won't be hearing about that much from your mentors in the incubator either. They uh, will probably only be talking about uh, uh, community-based things. Uh, because the expectation at uh, the incubator and at Apache at large is that if you develop a healthy community, good code will follow naturally. So to start with phase one, uh, in my opinion, one of the most educational tasks which you can undertake during your time at Apache is to craft a proposal to incubate a project. Because you need to think, you need to learn a lot about Apache itself, and then you need to think very hard about what makes a project succeed at Apache, or in some cases, what makes a project not succeed within the context of the incubator or within the context of Apache-style uh, collaborative development. And so uh, we're going to key off of the, the incubator uh, proposal template and use it as a framework for discussion. Uh, we're not going to go through all of it because there's 33 bullet points in there, and that would take, uh, uh, I'm already going to take up a fair amount of time just with the ones we are. So we'll skip some, but it's a good framework to talk about some things. So the first task is to describe your project in three different lengths. So the abstract is a single sentence description of your project. The proposal is a single paragraph description of your project. And then finally, background means not a history of the project, but instead a description of the problem domain in which the project exists. Uh, and in terms of getting the most out of the incubation experience, I would say that it is worthwhile to concentrate on the abstract, the single sentence description, because that is something uh, uh, which was very useful for uh, marketing later. People will see that uh, abstract. You can use that in a lot of different contexts, having a, a very short summary of what your project is about. It is second only to the name of the project in terms of its uh, marketing potential. And so it's worth spending a lot of time trying to come up with a single, very short, con uh, concise description of what your project is about. The next part of the proposal is the rationale. And that means, within the context of that problem domain, why does your project need to exist? And I'm going to share with you now a quote from a fellow by the name of uh, Stefano uh, Mazzocchi. Uh, and this was floated by now uh, almost a decade and a half ago in October of 2000 on the Cocoon developers list. 
And his idea is that good ideas and bad code build communities, while the other three combinations don't build communities. Uh, let's uh, just explore the uh, logical uh, uh, implications of that. So we have good ideas and good code. And why doesn't that work out? Well, I guess it's because nobody really needs to fix anything. You look at the implementation, and you say, hey, well, I guess I can't really improve on that. Then you have bad ideas and good code, and bad ideas poorly executed. Well, nobody needs to fix anything, but who would want to, I guess. Uh, and then you have bad ideas and bad code, and let's just skip that one. And then we have good ideas and bad code, where people yearn for the code to work perfectly, but it does not. And therefore, they see the sloppy code, they see some problem with it, and then they're motivated to fix it. And then that is the hook that brings them into uh, collaborating with you, and that's how people join your community. Uh, at least that's the, the, the idea of that quote from Stefano. I think it's uh, perhaps a little bit overblown. It's an entertaining uh, uh, and counterintuitive idea. Uh, but really, the good ideas and good code tends to work pretty well, so long as the project isn't just finished and complete. Uh, uh, and so long, I think the central insight here is that the opportunities to improve the code must be apparent to the community, or to, excuse me, to the potential recruits, because then that they will uh, come in and they'll uh, want to work on your code. We also want you to describe the initial goals for the project. And what we really want to know here is, is your plan crazy pants? Because it takes a certain amount of energy to spin up an incubator podling. And it's OK if you get past that initial phase and then your podling doesn't work out. That happens from time to time. We have a certain attrition rate. It's all cool. But it, at least get to checkpoint one. It's important that we at least get to checkpoint one. We also ask you to describe the current status of the project. And that is not status in terms of technology but in terms of how far along the community is with regards to implementing Apache ideals and developer practices. We also want to know who your core developers are, because those people uh, are going to be supplying the energy, the considerable energy that it takes to uh, bring an incubator podling through the incubator. Because it's not just uh, uh, the development. You're going to have to be doing a lot of community development in addition to that, and that takes energy. And in my opinion, the text in these sections, in these uh, mini essays, should show a certain uh, evidence of uh, the struggle to uh, uh, understand uh, the challenges of running a project in a meritocracy. It's possible to just describe this stuff uh, in a fairly straightforward, boilerplate way by looking at what other projects have written. But if you can apply it to your community, I think it's to your benefit to think about these problems. Uh, another thing to think about here is that uh, uh, while describing your community, you may find that your project is not really suitable for Apache. And this actually touches on a, a question that was asked at, at an earlier presentation today in terms of uh, uh, what, why might you bring your project or why might not you bring your project to Apache. So let's think about some sort of communities that might be not well suited to uh, uh, Apache. A solo project. That's a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, mechanism for uh, having a, a, a perfectly legitimate model for a project. There's lots of important open source projects run by single developers who have final say over everything. But that doesn't really work for Apache, uh, where we develop communities. And then another project, type of project which might not be suitable for Apache is one which is finished, one which is, has minimal maintenance. because. It's uh, important there be a certain level of code churn in order to be continually refreshing the community. We also ask in your proposal that you assess uh, your project with regards to known risks. And by known risks, it means stuff that the incubator has seen in the past that, that has been a problem for podlinks, or potentially uh, uh, problems which have afflicted top-level projects at Apache as well. And there are several subsections that describe these kinds of problems. Uh, and the, this is an opportunity for, uh, to, as I say, assess your project. And uh, I will say that the majority of proposals actually have risks in one or more of these areas. It's not that we want you to assert that your project is free from these uh, risks. It's that we want to make sure that you actually understand them in the hopes that you will 
inoculate you against them if you can later account for these problems and mitigate those problems during incubation. So one of the situations, these are all sort of tied together, and so I'll address them as a group. Uh, orphan products, homogenous developers, reliance on salary developers, those all tend to spring up if you have, say, a single uh, 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 sponsor who is uh, uh, supplying all of the contributors. And the answer to all of them, although they really are subtly different problems, the answer is simply to diversify your contributor base uh, so that you have a lot of different contributors coming from a lot of different organizations. And then if any one of them uh, uh, goes away, or if any specific group is actually behaving in too, an ins uh, too insular a manner, that's actually what homogenous developers means. Uh, you have to worry that a group of homogenous developers will go off and make decisions on their own and back channels and thereby exclude other people. That's a constant risk that we have to deal with in the incubator. Uh, and ultimately, at a, uh, uh, for top-level projects as well, uh, it's something that people, yes, please go ahead. Well, I will ha happily, uh, uh, we will definitely be coming to uh, uh, more of those techniques as we go on. Uh, one of them, you know, uh, one of them is simply recruitment, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, and we've talked about some ideas already in terms of uh, 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 having uh, uh, bad code or some uh, other handle for people to grab a hold of. That gets people involved and that uh, outsiders involved who are users and then they become contributors. So that's one technique that we've already discussed, and there will be a number of others, uh, particularly towards the end of the talk. Uh, if you think of your question later on, uh, be, uh, absolutely, I look forward to it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so avoiding insularity is important. Another problem which uh, comes up is that uh, uh, the incubator does sort of specialize in opening up closed projects. Uh, uh, but still, if you have... Uh, uh, Almost nobody or nobody on the project who has experience with open source, that's a problem because there's a lot of skills involved with running an open source project effectively, uh, such as non-real-time communication, uh, making decisions in a collaborative fashion in, in the, uh, in the, under the constraints of non-real-time communication. And uh, it's okay to have a mix where you have some people that have uh, uh, no experience and some people that have some experience. If you have zero experience associated with a proposal, what we've seen is that uh, projects that, that come that way are often not well conceived. Uh, you, it may be that the abstraction is not suitably general and won't apply at other organizations. It may be that the problem, uh, uh, the project as well as it solves a problem within a limited uh, scope, when it applies to an outs uh, a larger problem domain, then all of a sudden its fragility is revealed. And so simply throwing the, a, a, a project over the wall to open source it tends not to be effective. It's good to have uh, open sourcers within your organization. And it's good if you are an open sourcer within your organization to help with your, uh, 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 help your, uh, your employer to make that happen. Uh, in the proposal, we ask that you uh, supply resources uh, uh, or request resources. And my tip here would be, uh, to start minimal, less is more. Uh, and then on the developer list later, discuss what resources you're going to need. Now in some cases you know that there's going to be something extraordinary, like when OpenOffice came to the incubator and we were going to need gobs and gobs and gobs of, uh, of, uh, of, of bandwidth in order to get their uh, binaries out. So those are, those are exceptions. But things such as mailing lists, it's good to start off with the bare minimum and then discuss adding them later on the developer list because those discussions are healthy to have. And then uh, at the last bit of the, uh, uh, of the proposal, there's, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions with very straightforward answers which aren't essay questions, they just ask you to list com uh, committers and so on. And I'm only going to touch on uh, two of those. Uh, one of them is the mentors. These are members of the incubator PMC who are, as it was put earlier today, are the boots on the ground uh, which help your project. They oversee the podling, they interact with you directly, they provide guidance. Uh, and then there's the champion. The champion helps with the proposal and say, uh, in terms of getting the most out of the incubator, I think it's very important that the, pod, uh, that the champion not deny the podling the experience of crafting the proposal. Uh, uh, the core developers who are bringing the, uh, uh, those are the people that should author the bulk 
of the proposal because this is a great experience. So after the proposal is submitted, then there will be a discussion on General Incubator, and then uh, it will most likely be a successful vote because most proposals that make it this far get accepted. What happens is there's a winnowing process as you make it through the entire laborious thing that we just went through, and you discover that your project is not right for Apache. So a lot of uh, things don't even uh, get proposed, uh, get full proposals at the incubator, even if there are some explorations. Uh, that having been said, uh, the incubator likes to take chances, and the ASF likes to be challenged by new ideas. And uh, that means that not every project works out. Uh, so let's talk a bit about what happens if the uh, podling doesn't work out. Well, first of all, assume that your podling is going to work out, because most podlings do. You should plan to graduate. But if it doesn't work out, well, all projects have a life cycle. And if you're, uh, when we don't keep the zombie projects alive at Apache. Uh, so if a podling reaches it's the end of its useful life cycle while it's in incubation, that's fine. Uh, uh, retire the project and then start something new and maybe come back if that's appropriate. And every, uh, uh, so long as you clean up the uh, campsite when you're done, everybody's going to be happy with you and we'll welcome you back with open arms. But for now, uh, let's plan for graduation. And that means we'll assume that the proposal has been accepted. Congratulations. Now we're in the setup phase uh, of incubation. This is mostly mechanical. It's mostly about setting up various uh, pieces of infrastructure. But it's an opportunity, if you're trying to get the most out of the ASF, to familiarize yourself with the infra team. Uh, and uh, although your mentors can do most of this work, it is to your advantage to uh, uh, help them as best you can, because you'll learn more about the uh, infrastructure of the ASF if you do that. So, in yes, go ahead. No, they're distinctly not volunteers. Uh, early on in the uh, history of the ASF, it was all volunteer, and that worked up to a point. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, as with many dirty jobs, uh, uh, you wind up having stuff that volunteers do not handle well. And so we have the infrastructure people were the first contractors that the organization has hired. That has since been accelerated. We now have an executive assistant who handles things such as uh, uh, keeping tabs on the, uh, 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 on the people who we fundraise with and who also uh, uh, organize a lot of the, uh, 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 does like the travel assistance committee was the first thing that she spends a lot of time on. Uh, we also have, are hiring a, uh, uh, an outside group to do uh, our audit for the Apache Software Foundation. So we're, we hire professionals and contractors on a regular basis, and Infra was actually the first example of that. There's not an SLA on that. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, although they are contractors, they are definitely the, the inf uh, 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 Apache has, they've got an awful lot of projects to answer to. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I suppose we could uh, withstand having a larger infra team, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of overhead associated with that. So, so the answer is, as much as we would like the answer to be yes, it's no, and it probably will never be uh, 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 yes. And have they, have they agreed to set it up? Is this something that they've said yes to?
Well, I'm going to t uh, uh, the next thing that I'm actually going to talk about here is how to request new features of uh, uh, infra. And uh, uh, I actually just want to say that this does not necessarily apply to your project specifically, uh, uh, because I, I do want to talk about the history of infra the infrastructure team. Uh, uh, classically, uh, we have had a lot of problems where projects have said, I need feature X. I will help set up feature X. I will help maintain feature X. And then the volunteer. Uh, helps to set it up, they use it, and then they go away forever, and Infra is left maintaining support for that. And that's one of the reasons that actually it can be difficult to get Infra to agree to support new uh, technologies and why it makes sense to actually uh, 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 acquaint yourself with the existing technologies and, and use them as best you can. Now, if there's simply a technology which is not uh, available from infra and nothing uh, will substitute, as opposed to say you know a different wiki software. Uh, uh, then there's uh, uh, then there's more of a rationale, but nevertheless, I think that 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 perhaps is a context that that helps to understand why it's sometimes difficult to get new uh, uh, pr things set up at a at the with the ASF infra team. Well, let's talk more afterwards. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, Well, they get it, uh, forwarding is set up. In, in practice, what happens is if you send something to the old list, it'll get forwarded to the new one. So uh, the migration tends to be not th uh, 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 that painful in the grand scheme of things. Uh, uh, it perhaps, uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but this is not something that I'm really, it's, it's, uh, uh, th we have, we have, a, uh, there's, that's, that's a one particular class of problems. It has been uh, pretty heavily discussed. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, that was uh, productive, uh, uh, and I get now to skip some sections. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, because this is actually, uh, we've managed to talk about some things which uh, basically would have been in there anyway, such as, uh, uh, well, I will talk a little bit more about the uh, mailing list, because this is actually a technique for uh, expanding the community that you asked about earlier. So one thing is about adding user lists. We actually advocate that people, if they do not, uh, projects, if they do not have high traffic on their developer list, not to start a user list right away, but instead ask that users subscribe to the developer list. And the rationale for that is that if you then get uh, uh, those users listening in on developer conversations, they may, uh, there may be an opportunity for them to get involved. Now at a certain point, you wind up with uh, uh, a developer mailing list which has so much traffic on it that it's oppressive to users, and that's the time to start a user mailing list. But it's a useful technique to think about for uh, expanding your community that uh, uh, you add the user list only when the time is ripe. Uh, we'll just skip that one for now. OK, we'll now get to the uh, uh, IP clearance phase and talk about ways to, uh, uh, to get the most out of the IP clearance phase. And as with uh, uh, the setup phase was an opportunity to familiarize yourself with the infra team. Uh, in the IP clearance phase, it's an opportunity to familiarize yourself with the legal affairs team. And uh, one way to do that, and I, uh, I think that this is a very worthwhile thing, is to subscribe to the legal discuss list at Apache as a Podlink member and familiarize yourself with some of the uh, questions that get asked on that and some of the uh, controversies. This will be the areas where we discuss licensing, uh, uh, where people ask questions, uh, outsiders ask questions about the Apache license or various things. Uh, and the IP clearance phase is also an opportunity to uh, get some uh, uh, time in thinking about legal stewardship because when you are a PMC member of a top level Apache project, uh, you are charged with the legal stewardship of your project. The foundation does not dictate the technical direction of projects, but we do require that projects follow certain legal guidelines. And that is actually the only, uh, uh, the, uh, the primary responsibility of a PMC is that. And then uh, uh, the technical stuff, we leave that to you to, uh, to handle. So this is an opportunity to, uh, 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 during the IP clearance phase, to think about this stuff. Uh, 
I guess that might be a way of, uh, of selling it because not a lot of people actually find this fun. Uh, you may be, uh, some people find that uh, worthwhile. Uh, so the first stage of IP clearance is uh, a, a code grant. And this is, sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's a complete project killer. Uh, it has, uh, on the one hand, you've got, say, a single organization which owns all of the intellectual property that is contributed, and, and they, one person's signature on a code grant gets the entire thing in. At the other extreme, you might have a project which exists for 10 years outside of Apache, and might have scores of contributors, so you have to have participate in a code grant, especially if it's uh, uh, existed under a different uh, uh, open source license during that time. And uh, we have had experiences where a single copyright holder has failed to come through with the code grant, and the podlink dies because they have no starting point. And we've also had situations where uh, individual contributors have not come through, and then their contributions had to be extracted, and then, their uh, uh, and then replacements written. And that uh, can severely harm a uh, podlings uh, momentum because you have to spend a lot of time before even the first release getting the code base back to the point where you were before you even enter Apache. So it's, uh, it helps if you have a good strong idea before you even enter uh, Apache as to whether or not you're going to be able to get all of your contributors on board and whether this is going to be successful. Uh, so uh, uh, then, uh, uh, we'll skip that. Uh, another thing about uh, getting the most out is that uh, dependency licensing is something that we expect you to have uh, 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 solved by the time that you leave the incubator. It, uh, sometimes there are dependencies whose licenses we would not allow for a top-level project, but we will grant temporary exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis for incubating projects. Uh, uh, and those uh, uh, exceptions are granted by way of making inquiries by, uh, from the legal affairs team. So this is, once again, an opportunity to familiarize yourself with uh, legal affairs. Another thing that happens during the IP clearance, yes, go ahead. GPL is tough, sometimes LGPL, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but also GPLs, actually. Uh, uh, So what we, uh, uh, so the project comes in and it might have a GPL dependency. Uh, you definitely will not be uh, uh, allowed to bundle that dependency with the uh, uh, download. Well, you'll have to force your users to download that separately. Uh, uh, but in addition, actually, a top-level project could not have a, a, a GPL dependency because the, uh, the Free Software Foundation maintains that simply using the interface of a GPL library deri uh, creates a derivative product and therefore kicks in the, uh, the copyleft provisions of the GPL. That's unacceptable to our customers. And, and so uh, uh, now we don't feel like fighting that. Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, the, the, the FSF maintains that. Uh, uh, this is actually something which the Oracle versus Google uh, 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 decision uh, touches on in terms of the, uh, the judge decided that using an interface was not. We're, I don't want to get too far off on this. I can talk for a long time about this stuff. But uh, uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, to, uh, the incubator, you can sometimes get variances where, uh, uh, well, a top-level project would not be allowed to have a GPL dependency. End of story. An incubating project may if you apply to legal, uh, if you ask of legal affairs, uh, yes, you can, uh, they will sometimes grant exceptions. And you will have to, by the time you uh, graduate, you will have to have that dependency removed and, and replaced with something else. LGPL is not acceptable either for top-level projects. Uh, that one's a, a bit of a tougher one. There was actually a very lengthy dis uh, discussion on the legal discuss list about that, which I participated in. Be happy to talk about that afterwards. OK, so that's the dependency licensing issue. Uh, uh, the, another thing which must uh, happen is the, a project name check. Uh, we'll uh, see whether or not there is the, your, trademark, your name is trademarkable. It's, positive it, it, uh, it's a positive thing if it is. Uh, it's important that your name at least not uh, violate somebody else's trademark. And so this is a prerequisite before, we'll even, uh, before the first incubating release can get, uh, get out. And another thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of projects come into the incubator, and frankly, 
the names aren't very well chosen. Uh, I think that it's an opportunity when you come to the incubator for the very start, think hard about the name. Uh, uh, and try. it's even better if you can do it and avoid a ch name change while you're in the incubator. We right now have a podling which is apply, uh, uh, being proposed. They haven't yet run the, uh, uh, a vote yet, but it's called Stratosphere. And we already have a Stratos, and there's lots of other Stratosphere projects out there. It is being strongly recommended to them that they consider changing the name. And we'd love it if they actually were willing to do that before they actually came, uh, before they make the proposal, because they won't have to go through the infrastructure changes of that. But it, uh, uh, having a project which is not well named, like you know, Apache Cloud, <laughs> it's not going to fly. Uh, you have to. There's a vice president of branding. Uh, uh, his name's uh, Shane Kirkaroo. He's pres uh, uh, president at this Apache Con, and he'll be giving talks about this. Uh, uh, if they do not, it, uh, the incubator, uh, uh, I can't remember when this has actually happened that we would actually forcibly re uh, re uh, reject the project, the Podlings name. I don't think that's ever happened. But Podlings have been renamed, uh, such as Apache Callback was later named to uh, Cordova while they were in the incubator. The phone gap was not uh, going to be used. Yes? Well, uh, uh, you know, people are really attached to their names, no matter how lousy they are. <laughs> so, so that's why I, I'm making the point that, you know, think hard about that. You're right about that. Uh, uh, however, coming to the Apache Software Foundation is a big enough change and a large enough publicity producing event that it's a really an opportunity to do that. Now, I'm not saying that nothing is lost, but I'm saying this is a great opportunity to do it and finally uh, uh, and make that uh, a clean break. It's the best time you're going to have. We've now made it through uh, IP clearance. It's time for the first release. Uh, there is a five-stage Apache release process. I'm not going to talk about it today, because I've got another talk on Wednesday. I hope to see some of you there. Uh, it's, there's a lot of detail on that. And I'd like to cover other things. Uh, so uh, some of the challenges associated with making your first release. Uh, you have to learn a lot about Apache procedures, and that can be quite involved. The documentation is diffuse. Uh, you also have to understand licensing documentation, which means learning about licensing itself. Uh, uh, and you're going to be responsible for this when uh, uh, you have to deal with, a as a top-level project, bringing in new dependencies and such. And this is why I advocate getting as involved as possible with legal affairs as early on as you can. And then finally, you've got to pass the incubator PMC vote. And sometimes incubator PMC votes are hard to scare up. Uh, and after you get through that first release, you'll find that it's habit forming, and then uh, you'll need to make more. Uh, you'll want to make more. But there's also a, something which happens as, the, as uh, uh, the project goes on. In open source, people come and go. And that includes your mentors. And the mentors tend to go more often than they come. Uh, you tend to get mentors at the very start of incubator, and it's hard to get more later because it's hard to spin up new ones. And so. That can make it hard if uh, uh, you don't have people who are d uh, on the incubator PMC or directly mentoring your project to get enough votes to get subsequent releases out. So there are some things you can do to help mitigate that problem. Uh, uh, one is that you can simply make voting easier by documenting your, uh, uh, what it takes to uh, make a list of the checklist of what people ought to be checking. And then at, uh, uh, when you vote plus one on a release, Say, I checked this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And then your mentor can say, oh, wow, they checked all this stuff. Great. Uh, I can just verify that that actually worked. And that makes the, uh, uh, the mentor's job on reviewing the release candidate that much easier. And the other thing is, don't make people re review multiple release candidates when there's obvious problems. If, have your, uh, if you're a release manager, don't supply something which is just garbage. Because every time that uh, uh, the mentor, who is not a typically someone technically involved in your project has to assess that. It's quite laborious checking a project, when you're, especially when your primary responsibility as a mentor checking things over is legal. So it's a lot of work, and it's not something that even our mentors, uh, uh, 
They may be more well-versed than the average Apache uh, uh, member in terms of licensing, but they're typically developers and people who enjoy mentoring first before they're legal people. There are, there are some people who are more expert than others, uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's still better if you don't make people do this over and over again. So now we're at the stage where we're talking about uh, uh, growing the community. Uh, and uh, this is a quote from uh, Henry Yandel, a former uh, 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 director of the ASF. And it came to me by way of Chris Matman, who's a current director of the ASF and was a mentor for my project. And this was actually briefly referenced in one of uh, Suresh and, uh, 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 and Roman's slides earlier today, which is that the, uh, you're not just in the software engineering business, you're actually in the recruiting business. And just to think about what that means, it means that if you have a, uh, 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 if you're an ace coder but a poor communicator, you're not going to be able to make a project thrive at Apache. If you're a poor coder and an ace communicator, you can have a large impact on a project. You can't do it by yourself, but if you can uh, 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 shepherd a community and manage uh, uh, a bunch of other developers and coordinate effectively, you can have a very large impact on a project. So uh, talking about growing the community, uh, uh, what the incubator expects is that by the time you graduate, you will have recruited successfully. You will have persuaded someone who had nothing with your project to do, uh, nothing to do with your project before, to voluntarily contribute to your project. That's not an easy sell. Uh, uh, so, uh, and that's often why uh, I would say it's some of the most uh, uh, challenging. Uh, 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 a lot of people find it the, the, the most difficult part of the incubation process. Uh, and the thing, if you think about it, the previous sections, if you're the core developer, everything's still under your control. You can bull through with the uh, uh, trying to chase down every last person who has uh, contributed to the code. You can deal with all of the legal issues. You can deal with coding around uh, dependencies. Uh, you can uh, uh, deal with all of the licensing issues, but as soon as you actually have to uh, uh, get, persuade someone to join your project, all of a sudden your success is dependent on outsiders. So some of the things that uh, uh, will help, uh, uh, now first we're going to talk about some fundamentals. Uh, now we'll talk about this stuff, although it seems kind of basic because frankly almost nobody gets everything, all of this right. The obvious stuff, make sure your website is decent, it's got to be clean, it's got to be, you know, don't make it have no, uh, make it sure it has no mistakes. You should simply exude con uh, competence with your website. Uh, and then there's things such as your code base. Uh, having a simple, reliable build will make it so that people don't get thwarted uh, uh, just when they try to even build the project. Uh, uh, because then, uh, uh, and also make sure that you have good build documentation uh, so that you know, they open up the, the source archive and they're like, what do I do with this? And they can't even get it. That's going to be a problem. So uh, uh, also uh, documentation, tutorials, some stuff which once again uh, uh, doesn't sound sexy. If you do it well, it's going to make a big difference. Uh, and included in that, it's actually important that you include clear instructions on how to contribute to your project because that will once again re remove a barrier that otherwise people might not make it past. Looks like Suresh has, uh, uh, wants to speak on that. Suresh, why don't you get, uh, take an answer? Yeah.
Thank you for your excellent contribution, Suresh. So uh, once you actually have someone who has supplied a, a contribution, whether that's via a GitHub pull request or a patch to Jira or whatever, it's important that you, uh, uh, this is once again a fundamental. Make sure you don't drop it on the ground. Once again, it's something that people do wrong all the time. People simply don't respond in a timely manner to contributors, and then they wonder why they don't have new pe uh, uh, people who are uh, coming to the project. Make sure that, uh, you have to make, and the reason this doesn't happen is because you have other priorities. But you really have to review people's code in a timely manner. That's important. Another technique uh, for, is to actually set up ducks for people to knock down. Uh, create some beginner tickets. Uh, that can be, uh, 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 and that gets people who uh, aren't sure how to get started uh, contributing to the project, can familiarize themselves with the innards of the project. An important thing about this is that, once again, if you're a core developer, you have a much more effective way of finishing those kinds of things. You can just do them yourself in a tenth of the time. But this is why, when you're in the incubator, your core developers need to budget time for community building in addition to uh, any coding that they may be taking on. That's very important, uh, uh, and it's something that people wonder why they're not getting enough, uh, uh, they may not have budgeted enough time to actually do hardcore uh, uh, community building. Uh, some other things, uh, try not to nip people's, people's patches. Uh, be forgiving when people, uh, is coming, especially the first contribution that people make. If you can accept the flawed one, do it. Uh, and then fix it later uh, uh, when they're, you know, maybe six months later when they're already, uh, uh, they've already been hooked. Uh, so, so now, once you've got people who are already committers, uh, you've managed to draw them in from the, that phase, here are some techniques to uh, make them uh, increase their involvement in the project itself. When they are, if you're a core developer, I'm speaking of, this is advice to core developers here primarily, leave space for other people to answer user questions. Don't answer the question right away yourself. Now, if nobody answers the question, or if you're the only person with expertise, then by all means, uh, uh, speak up. But try not to preempt other people and deny them the opportunity to actually deepen their involvement in the project and service uh, uh, and display their expertise. Uh, hat tip to Joe Schaefer for this particular one. Uh, uh, if you're a core developer, try to vote last. And that means allow the consensus to develop uh, uh, f from other people's contribution, rather than drive it yourself. Uh, so if the project tends to move in a different direction, or uh, if you can guide it subtly with subtle hints, or if it just moves the direction you want to go already, that's ideal. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, but those are uh, uh, the kind of situations where if you're the core developer, if you want other people to get more involved, it really helps to uh, let them talk amongst themselves and uh, uh, be in control of the project to whatever degree they can. Uh, a related one is that if you have the opportunity to uh, lose an argument, do it. Uh, this one means banking goodwill for later. And a, a, an example of this would be say that someone has submitted a patch which has both a lousy interface and a lousy implementation. Are you about the interface? Let the interface uh, implementation slide. You can fix the implementation later. The interface has greater weight. It may be worth it to actually have a productive debate about this, but don't take them to the wall uh, uh, going after every last uh, piece of code. It's better to just argue about the stuff that matters and then let the rest slide. Uh, tried to demonstrate that earlier. Uh, uh, never lose an opportunity to say thank you. Uh, and in fact, a ratio to shoot for in terms of offering people positive uh, 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 feedback. Try to have a ratio of five to one for uh, uh, positive feedback versus negative. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, share responsibility as best you can. That would involve, say, if you're, not the, uh, if you're the core developer, have somebody else be release manager. Or as I was talking about with Rob earlier, uh, uh, have somebody else other than a core developer be a vice president. Treat the vice president position like a develop, uh, department chair. And I think we're coming up on the end of the uh, time here. Uh, uh, so I'm going to fast forward through uh, a couple of other slides and simply get to the conclusion here. I hope uh, we've made it through now the five phases. And uh, hopefully the uh, skills that uh, by the time you get uh, through the incubator, that the skills that you've acquired will no longer be mysterious and they will serve you well 
uh, come uh, graduation and uh, in your time uh, as an Apache top-level project. And I'll leave you finally with, uh, uh, there's a document which was called the What to Expect document, which we uh, supply to incoming podlings. And this was written by a member of the Apache Flex community after Flex had made it through uh, uh, for the benefit of subsequent podlings. And, I'd like to, and it talks about things such as Apache is a volunteer organization, seize the day, seize control of your, your situation in order to uh, get the most out. But I'd also like to add that our expectation is that some of you, after going through incubation, will come back, like Suresh did, like I did. And uh, that is our expectation. We expect that not only will you uh, thrive in the incubator, but you'll come back and you'll help other projects. And we look forward to that. And so uh, we've taken some questions already. Uh, I think at, at, that I now actually we're at the end of the, uh, uh, our time. So I think at this point we'll take uh, all subsequent questions offline. We've got plenty of time for that since it's the end of the day. And now uh, I'll be going to the, uh, uh, the, committer, uh, uh, the committer reception. And uh, I look forward to chatting with uh, you all either now or later. Thank you very much.